Hello and welcome to this video and this video is going to be entitled Does Humour Belong in Music? Of course I'm not the first person to use that title. This was the name given by Frank Zappa to a video cassette he released in the 1980s. It also, uh, he also released a live album in the 1980s called Does Humour Belong in Music which actually was a little bit more extended than the video and had some extra tracks on. Um, Frank Zappa fans may be, um, have clicked onto this video thinking I'm going to talk about that, uh, and I'm not, but uh, it's interesting actually, you know, before we get on to have a little bit of a chat about that uh, video. Um, I think it, it was released sort of 85, it's from the 1984 tour. The 1984 tour had a sort of cut down band, it's still a pretty expanded uh, band. But it didn't. That tour didn't seem, to me at any least, at any rate, to um, really focus on the sort of virtuoso elements of um, Frank Zappa's music. He had a very strong vocal lineup um, with Ike Willis, Ray White, and uh, Bobby Martin. So there was a lot of songs, a lot of vocal harmonies, and a, and a focus, I think, on the more, you know, uh, funnier material in Frank Zappa's catalogue. Now. Um, and, the, and, the, and what, what's interesting is, is that uh, he then released a CD and I think for us Frank Zappa fans we don't really count that in the discography. I actually bought the CD and I had it. Um, but we don't really see it as there being an 80s live album uh, like that. But there is and I think it's, it, it, except for the stuff that's on you can't do that on stage anymore. It could well be the only official you know, dedicated live album that came out at the time, you know, that covers the 84 tour. 84 tour's a funny tour. Anyway, um, some of you will have that album, and those of you who have that album will know that it focuses on the more comic elements of Frank Zappa's catalogue. Now, I know there are people out there that will be frustrated by the fact that Frank Zappa made novelty songs. Are they novelties? Isn't everything in art and novelty. Um, there's people out there that do not like the idea of people claiming to make high art, claiming to say that something is um, very important because importance is linked to seriousness. Sorry about that, that's my phone going off. That little whistle, if you hear that little whistle, it's a quite a comic whistle, it might chime in every now and then because there's obviously a, com a conversation going on on WhatsApp or something. And, and, and that, that whistle may chime in in the same way that a sound effects might chime in in a carry-on film, you know, so adding little comical moments. But actually, this video is going to be quite serious. So I actually want to seriously uh, discuss this idea. Uh, because I think there's, out, there's people out there that find they can't stomach it, you know. Oh, Frank Zappa, yes, he was a very good composer and he was innovative. It's a shame that he uh, had to sully how great he was by making not only, you know, comedy songs, but comedy songs that had, like, sort of sexual content in there or a bit scatological. People, they don't like that. They, 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 they have difficulty. I think some people... I'm not one of those people. Um, I think that humour is actually a very complex and difficult aesthetic feat. It's a very difficult thing to pull off. The reason is, is because we can generically um, locate heavy metal. We can generically locate um, disco, goth, but comedy music has to deliver, right? You know if you've made a song and you're trying to be funny and it's not funny, you know when that's happened. Um, I've actually hit this with this channel because anyone who's been following my channel will notice that the, recently my uh, posts have been getting a lot more sillier. Uh, and there's a reason for that and I'm gonna hopefully get into that on this video. Um, and, uh, I made a video where I'd actually got in a bit of a, not a mood, but I was getting a little bit niggled by some of the silly comments. I think any YouTuber is going to get this, and really I should be grown up and go, just ignore the comments. A comedy whistle there. Uh, ignore the comments and just get on with 
what you're doing, but I can't help it, you know, I can't help it, you know, it's, it's like, and I think part of it is because there's a sort of snobby, smug, anal retentive seriousness that often goes with these styles of music. And when I see it, I just can't help but puncture it, right? So I'm not going to come on here and just say, you know, you're wrong, I don't like it, because I, I, I'm not like that. You know, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Anyone can put, you can put whatever you want in the comments, you know, whatever you want. If you want to say, I'm an idiot because I haven't included something, you know, or you, if you want to write off the, the whole worth of the whole channel because I didn't pick your favourite album, which seems to be a, a, a thing going, you know, or the other thing is, is that this sort of anal retentive completeness where, you know, I'll do 10 <laughs> choices and then people will say, but you have to have this album on. And then someone else says, you have to have it. I go, yeah, there's 10, there's 10 there. And I've picked my 10, you know, which one are you going to take off? Um, so, uh, you know, I suppose I get a little bit niggled by that, but it's, it's, they're in their complete rights to say it. And the only way I can really, you know, have a retort is by, you know, having a little bit of a joke about it. And I did this on one of the videos and it ended up with me really try to point out how really ludicrous it is to be doing top 10 videos, right? They're entertaining, they're um, instructive, I can talk about all different aspects of music and also the top 10s draw people in. I always wanna know what the top 10 is and half the fun is that some of them you agree with and some of, you, you, some of them you don't. So the top 10 format, I absolutely love and we could talk about all sorts of things. If if this was a top 10 now, it would be getting more views and I think people will get drawn in. But me titling this Does Humor Belong in Music, it might drag a few Zappa fans in, but if you check it, you'll see, I, I can predict, predict this now, the views will be lower on this video. Um, this is one of my serious philosophical videos, believe it or not, this is what you're getting. Uh, every now and then I feel like I should do that and talk about something a little bit more deeper, even though the viewers aren't gonna be there. Um, but I wish I could do that just flat out. I wish I could just come in here and talk about stuff. But um, you need the top tens. But the whole top ten, as much as I love it, and I do love a good top ten, I really do, um, they're, they're a little bit ludicrous. So um, I, I lampooned this by uh, creating a video where I looked at the top ten biscuits. I had no idea that the concept of a biscuit in, a, in, a, in the United States of America is completely different to us English biscuits. I didn't know that the, the, this us English had a completely different definition of biscuits. So how far that traveled, I don't know. But I really thought, let's just do something stupid and show how ridiculous it is, A, to have a top 10 in anything. And then I took the position of assuming I was absolutely right in my choices. And I kept that all the way through. And I hope it was marginally funny, um, but it was a frightening thing to do because to be funny is really, really difficult. That's my point, okay? Um, so if we just uh, you know, unpack what I've just said there, um, I'm niggled by something, I want to critique it. I feel that certain things are best critiqued with a sense of humor. The humor is going to do something. It's going to prick the bubble of that pomposity, right? I think that's really important. You know, somebody who's, who set themselves as, up as an authority, humor is going to pinprick. It's a bit like the court jester, right? The court jester that sits in the king's um, entourage, you know, whatever you call that. And the court jester there is there to poke fun at the king, all right? Uh, if the king can't tolerate that court jester, the king has become a despot, he's become a totalitarian dictator, right? Uh, the king needs to have his, or her, or it is his, it's, I'm trying to be politically correct here, but I can say his. The king or the queen, right? Um, if, if it would be her if it's a queen. But it's a, a him if it's a king. And there I'm doing it, you see. I am that sort of pomposity that's in political correctness, which I think there is a pomposity there. I just pinpricked by just showing up how confusing it is, silly as well. I'll just let the guy off, he said him. Uh, and that was, that's what the court jester does, you see. 
And that's a really important thing. And the court jester would often do it in song. This is the point. If you look at music history, okay, um, the comedy has been linked with music for a long time. I did a little bit, bit of research and I got back to the Greeks. There seem to have been Greek songs which were sort of satires on, on, on certain things. Satire and music go very well together, right? And so this um, idea of having songs or having music to lampoon has always been there since day one. Um, if we're looking at pop music, right? Um, popular music is, is in America based upon blues, right? Here in the UK, uh, we had a history of a thing called Music Hall. A music hall was a sort of um, entertainment for the masses, which included, you know, speciality, speciality acts, juggling, you know, song and dance and all that type of stuff. But the super superstars um, were singers of songs, and those songs were often very funny and very bawdy. Uh, for example, I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. That's a famous song from the music hall. This song is literally hundred hundred years old. Um, what else would you have? Um, there would be uh, things like um, I'm the man who broke the bank of Monte Carlo. It was these types of songs. And, and in the UK, music hall was very influential on popular music. Um, as films emerged in the UK, you start to have superstars of you know, the musicals here were people like George Formby. And F George Formby, um, his father actually came from the music hall tradition. And so George Formby, now I've got George Formby arms. I absolutely love George Formby. I may do a video just on George Formby. Um, and I tell you why I love George Formby, because when I was a kid, I watched George Formby films. My dad had George Formby albums. And he had a ukulele. A lot of people would have a ukulele. The ukulele has made a big comeback recently, but we had a ukulele in the house. The first guitar I ever learned was gu guitar chords to George Formby songs. And things like Leaning on a Lamppost and When I'm Cleaning Windows, which are, are comedy songs. And they are also a little bit cheeky, a little bit saucy as well. Um, now, if we look at um, who was fans, you know, of... George Formby. Well, I think the Beatles were fans of George Formby and we hear that musical tradition, we hear that, that influence of George Formby in the Beatles. And of course the Beatles come out and pretty much create rock music because the influence is so great. So comedy music in terms of rock music, the British end, is why it's, it's just wired right inside. It's just there from day one. But of course rock and roll comes from the blues, right? And the blues is full of very funny songs. This idea that the blues is about being sad. The, the blues will often um, tackle desperate situations. But there is a whole um, raft of blues songs that um, are funny. But actually, if we look at the sort of more the cheeky, saucy, saucy sexual content songs, there's a whole, you know... Um, Mass of those types of songs, very, very coarse humour. Um, anybody who wants to really get into that, the great Jelly Roll Morton um, was interviewed in, you know, shortly before he died. I think by Alan Lomax, and those interviews are out on YouTube, and he explains the history of certain songs, and some of the songs he's he's singing are absolutely obscene. I mean, really obscene, and so th that is in blues. This, it's this. Comedy music, low music, music that's talking about sex, that's talking about scatological things, all that. This music, rock music, that we all love, is based upon that, okay? And um, now, within pop music, there's a whole host of people who have made comedy um, songs. When I was a little uh, lad, my dad used to sing a song which was, uh, is called Hello Mudder, Hello Father, Here I Am at Camp Granada. And of course, this is a great big hit for, um, and I'm not going to be able to remember the guy's name, but this is a, a, a big hit in the early 60s. You know, comedy songs have been in the charts. Or, you know, if you think of, um, uh, 
Weird Al Yankovic, you know, there's a guy that's been around for 30 years making comedy songs, you know. Uh, when I grew up, there were so many novelty songs that um, got to number one here in the UK. I'm thinking Star Trekking Across the Universe. Anyone remember that here in the UK that got to number one? You know, always going forward because we can't refine reverse. That was the chorus, wasn't it? So there's a huge tradition here. Have I established the fact that there's a huge tradition you know, in music, for comedy music, for, for stuff that is just out and out comedy. Now, we know that the critics, and most of the public are just going to, they're not, is, is, is Weird Al Yankovic great art? I don't think anybody would say he is. Is that, that sort of parodying great art? Well, let's, let's park that idea. This is the question mark that we have hanging over this. Um, now, I'm a massive fan of Frank Zappa. Right, and I'm a Zappologist, as we all know. And I'm not one of those that are gonna go, yeah, he's absolutely brilliant, musically brilliant, companion so much stuff. I'm not so much of a fan of the funny stuff, you know. I, I think it would have been far more be better if he hadn't have done that, blah, blah, blah. I'm not one of those people. I think the the comedy aspects of his music, um, for me, jettison what he does into a realm that is so much heavier than art music. I distrust art music. I, interest, I distrust that virtue signaling of status and intellectual sort of presence by people pointing to certain, you know, artists. I distrust that. Um, now, I don't know whether I've said this on this channel, but I started out as a painter, not as a musician. And I did my degree in fine art. Um, fine art was linked to, to performance art and I watched a lot of performance art I saw a lot of conceptual art and a lot of the time what seems to be absurd to the general public you know, oh it's just a pile of bricks you know, that, that argument a lot of that stuff is often executed with a certain humour right? because I think humour does something and I, I really want to try and explain on this video and I'm getting there slowly I'm, 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 I'm slowly building up my ready for my argument why I think humour is an extremely high art form and how it works and, and why it's high and why having humour in music is very, very important and I think one of the highest things that you can do. Right, that's my argument here on this video. Um, now, the other thing is, um, if we step out of uh, high you know, sort of uh, comedy music. And we just start looking at normal bands, right? How many bands have a sense of humour in what they do? How many other bands, that they're, they're not direct parodies, but there's something entertaining and funny about it. I would argue that a band like ACDC have a whole ton of humour in their music, that ZZ Top, a lot of rock bands have a whole ton of humour in their music. Um, there's a tongue-in-cheekness and campness that goes with so many heavy rock and heavy metal bands, you know, or we can think of, um, you know, the, the whole genre really has, a, like Kiss, for example, uh, where it, it's like, are these guys for real? You know, there's, that, there's all that. Um, it also, you think of so much um, funk. We think of Parliament Funkadelic is... Uh, um, Free your mind and your ass will follow. Is that not just a great punchline to a great joke, you know? Uh, so I think there is a whole ton of music out there which we don't deem as comedy music, but it is also very funny. So it exists. It's huge. It's a big thing, you know. When I first started, thought of doing this video, which has been basically questioning my um, use of humour and silliness in these videos and I'm, I'm going to get that on get onto that at the end of this video um but let me try and come up with a um the function of humor I th and what i think it does um i think in life there are things that we like and that we don't like i think and i'm not about just not like and i'm about disgust Right? I think we have as human beings um, a disgust reaction 
to things. Now, um, that disgust, we can feel that about something even though it's hidden. So you, we can come up ac across something. Uh, now, some people will call this a bullshit detector, you know, this idea that you... You come across something, and this is it right, hang on, somebody's, try, there's somebody's trying to put me on that, and it's a real gut dislike. This isn't right. And um, I think this is often linked to authority, that authority figures are telling you something and you're supposed to accept it, right? It's the king, right? Um, now, I think rock and roll, one of the major roles it plays is it as Jack Black explains his School of Rock, an absolutely fantastic film that I absolutely love, um, which tells you more about rock music than possibly any other film ever made. He says, you know, rock music is about sticking it to the man, right? But if you're going to stick it to the man, you can just, you know, give the man the middle finger or you can do it like a court jester and you can just go up and stick a pinprick in the balloon of pomposity that exists right but when that exists it's hard to pull down the 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 uh, powers that be will be um holding this up with a great big structure now i think that humor is based upon getting the laugh right and what you get the laugh always when you deliver the punchline. And what the punchline does, it, it states the obvious, but it also points out something preposterous about the obvious. I think every single joke does that, you know. So um, here's a really silly joke. Um, what do you call an alligator in a vest? An investigator, right? Now, that is really silly. Um, now, some of you will be sat there going, that was a terrible joke. Uh, and if it is, it failed, right? Um, but if you had a little snigger, the reason is, is because when you say investigator, it's got, there's two meanings there. And the one is silly, right? An investigator is something very serious, someone who investigates something. But to put the picture of an alligator in a vest, you know, it's funny, Okay, it's the fact that there's a double meaning there and the double meaning is pointing out, it's going, oh, have a look at that again, it's quite silly really, look at that person, they look silly, all right? Look at that, what they're saying, that's silly. Um, now, when you deliver the punchline, you get a laugh. Now, what a laugh is, <laughs> a laugh is the bearing of teeth and a growl. It's a guttural, <laughs> right? That is the bearing of teeth, all right? Now, animals bear their teeth and make that sound when they come up against something they don't like. It's the way of getting something away from them, all right? In a polite society, perhaps the joke and the laugh is a way we can actually show our distaste for something um, without getting pitchforks out and torches and going on a vigilante, you know, uh, excursion. You know, it's it's a way of going, no, we, we, we don't accept this. This is just stupid, you know. And I think this is the great role that comedians play for us is to actually, um, whatever is going on, to be able to point fun at it. Okay, so um, going back to the British musical tradition, um, there is a song, and I know you cannot not laugh when you hear this song, called The Laughing Policeman. And the, the Laughing Policeman, right, doesn't, except for the title, it doesn't really um, <laughs> refer to a policeman at all. It's just a jolly song that has somebody laughing all the way through, and the laughing sort of follows a, a melody. <laughs> <laughs> now, why laughing policeman? Because when you call it the laughing policeman, you imagine a policeman. But what sort of policeman do you imagine if you listen to the laughing policeman? So for those of you who um, aren't British and don't know that tune, you know, pause it now. Go and have a listen to the laughing policeman and come back. Um, 
Now, if you were, uh, listen to that, I think it paints a picture of a certain jolly, perhaps a little bit portly policeman that is, uh, you know, full of the joys of life. He's easygoing. It's totally not what we require from a policeman. It's, an, it's a way of undermining policemen, right, which is so much more powerful than any sort of, you know, modern, you know, neo-Marxist, let's defund the police type of approach, you know, which, you know, people getting all irate, you know, and the police are this, the police are that. Um, there is an English way of doing that. It's if we make a song called The Laughing Policeman, and that, uh, even the policeman is going to laugh along to that. And this is, the, this is the interesting thing. Those who are in the positions of power, often comedy actually draws them into it as well. And then they have a little laugh and go, and it, 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 it's a really beautiful way of pin pricking pomposity. You know, we are laughing at, at the image of a nice friendly policeman against the image that we don't like so much. And it allows us to do that. If, if it was somebody who was just jolly anyway, it wouldn't be funny. It's funny because a policeman has um, a position of power. Now here in the UK, we have a huge tradition and it's part of the English aesthetic, um, which um, I have this thing called the English aesthetic. Um, I am an English person. Um, I think it's really specific to England as well. Uh, we could call it the British aesthetic. Um, and it's part of the English aesthetic for me is the ability to bring down figures of in authority. You know, we have the sort of, um, anyone who's watched any British comedy will see from Dad's Army through to a lower low through to The Office, we have a way of deflating those who are, are too full of themselves. It's always, always been there. Um, so, I think that's the power that um, comedy has, okay? Now music, okay, itself can be, how can I put it? Um, a lot of art forms have two parts to them. They have the form and the content. So the form of the piece is what, how it's, what it's made of, you know. Um, and in music, that's the notes and the chords and the, and the in fact, it's a power trio. That's the form of it. And it's got a verse and then a chorus in the middle. That's the form. And then you have the content. Now, um, in, unlike say film or, or um, books or even paintings, the content in music is much more ephemeral. Okay. Um, when it comes down to the song, the song provides the content and great songs are a real beautiful balance between form and content. Um, instrumental music or pure music, as I would call it, is a very powerful thing because it really acts on the emotions. I think of all the art forms, music is the most magical in its ability to evoke emotion, but its ability to tell a story it's nowhere near as, power, as powerful as a painting or a film or um, obviously a, a book, you know. Um, and because of that, I think that music can very easily become ideological. It, it, it's, it, it's look at the seriousness, you know, put on bark and listen to the seriousness and it, and it then gets equated very easily to the spiritual, to the, to the higher, things in life, you know, I think this is something that is very easy to associate with music, okay? Um, I think once you marry that with a story, a song, right? Or you marry it with um, comedic comic effects, uh, musical effects, you know, the, uh, the trumpet, you know, all that things, the little whistle, you know, all this type of stuff, that genre, if you want, um, acts, acts as a sort of pinprick to the pomposity of music. So if we go back to someone like Frank Zappa, not only does he write songs that are very funny, but if you listen to his compositions, 
he also uses those things as well. So this proves that his he integrally is 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 sticking a pin in that pomposity, in sticking the pin in that sort of ideological I know best thing. It's it's, it's there in the music. Um, one of his greatest orchestral pieces is called Bogus Pomp. And Bogus Pomp really takes cliched musical devices that ev evoke pomp, right? And it uses that to turn that idea on its head, right? I think in that track, we have fundamentally something that's very, very powerful in art. Very, very powerful. Um, and the fact is, when it comes to serious music, it's something that doesn't raise its head very often. Now, I'm not discounting all the music that doesn't do that, all the hip and cool music, all the music that is high and spiritual, that, 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 that takes us on a flight above ourselves, that elevates us, right? But the f music that does the thing I'm saying, that comes in and goes, hang on, you know, is this really, you know, as great as everybody thinks? Is, is, is this musician as cool as, as they think they are, right? That is so important to ground that music back here. Now, uh, on this channel, I have argued that there are the four titans upon which this channel is built. One of them is John Coltrane. One of them is John McGoughlin. God, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to say his name right. You know, keep, I say John McGoughlin, and everyone wants me to say John McGoughlin. I just can't say it. I'm trying my best, right? I'm trying my best, you know. Uh, see, I'm doing it again. I'm doing it again. This guy's no good. He doesn't even know how to speak, pronounce John McGoughlin. You know, I know how to pronounce John McGoughlin. Right? That, somebody who embodies that in a comment, I feel like going, <laughs> basically to them. Right? Just get over it. Listen to what I'm saying if you agree or not, but don't try and pull me down. You know, we all know what you're doing in doing that. You know, maybe it's really getting on your nerves. You know, why is it getting on your nerves so much that I'm pronouncing it in a way you don't like or that you don't think's correct? Okay, you know, and <laughs> here I am. See, I don't have to think about it. And I get a little bit annoyed, right? And the only way I can get annoyed is by doing this. My answer to this, right, and I'll say it again. For all of those of you who have put that comment on it, here's my answer to this. <laughs> Right, that's my answer there. Now, all you fans of my channel are going, oh, this is what we come here for. This is what we come here for, for these well-reasoned, well-argued points that Andy makes. And there's one, exactly. He's, he's just got those anti-John McGoughlin pronunciation Nazis. He's got them there, right by the short and curlies with that incredible retort. Do you want me to do it again? I'll just do a short one for you. There's a real short one. I've got three now. You can p choose which one you want. You know, I'd have the long one. Or you can have the short one. See, that's, that is the problem with me, you see. <laughs> this is the problem. This is what you've got. That's my answer to... That's my answer to everything. All right? You, a good laugh, a good joke. And it brings it all down to earth. You know that the fundamentally music is not brain surgery, okay? It's entertainment, it's here to, to, to decorate the time we have until we die. <laughs> That's what it's here for. And all you watching this channel, you know, I've seen the average age, you know, we've all not got that long, you know? <laughs> Someone said to me, they said, I love your channel. It's like, um, it's, it's a channel for old people where they can, they can forget about the fact that they'll be dead soon and remember all the music they used to like when they were young. See, that is the most British of compliments. <laughs> right, so um, I think this ability, right, or this technique or methodology of being able to just Put that in to life is really important. Now, do I want every single... I, I didn't even finish the point I made because I, uh, I got put off. So, yeah, the Titans, the three... 
The Four Titans. I was going to take John McLaughlin out of it then because I don't want to say his name anymore. The 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 Four Titans. So we've got John Coltrane, John McLaughlin. We've got Miles Davis. I think I pronounced right that. And we got Frank Zappa. Now, um, John McLaughlin. I, I, I'm just going to say it my way. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Okay. Can you just leave me be? Right. I've been saying it like that for like. 40 odd years. I ain't gonna change now. It's the whole point. And you're not gonna change now. We're all not gonna change. We're all stuck in our ways, right? Um, John McGoughlin and Coltrane, for me, brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly, represent that sort of spiritual high music that elevates. You know, both of those are trying to elevate me, okay? Miles Davis isn't. Miles Davis is from the street. Miles Davis is trying to mix the high with the low. You know, Miles Davis is funky, it's dirty, but it's also high art at the same time. It's a completely different thing, absolutely. And then Frank Zappa, of course, is the great master of taking comedy as an element right he takes comedy as an element it's like a shade it's like a, a a tone that he puts into his music right so he will have sort of modern classical percussion let's have a bit of that let's have some do what let's have some blues guitar right i've always felt that um zappa in formally is a modernist but content wise he's a postmodernist he takes all the content of modernism, but he puts it together in a very postmodernist way. He's, he enjoys putting um, one thing against another that doesn't quite work. He enjoys those jolts. Now, there's a really interesting uh, story that I read that, uh, it's not a story, uh, um, uh, George Duke came up with a, a, a great story from this time with Frank Zappa, you know. So, uh, George Duke, is a sort of post Coltrane improviser, heavy heavyweight jazz musician, one of the greatest jazz keyboardists of the 1970s, without a doubt. So he comes out that post Coltrane world and he goes into Frank Zappa's band, and uh, he wants to make music that's as heavy as Coltrane, the Thelonious Monk, or all these people that he's, you know, Bill Evans, you know, Sonny Rollins. He wants to make music like that. And Frank Zappa comes along to him and says, I think, I think which is really telling, he said, you know that music, that music is really heavy. He says, I think it's heavy, Coltrane's heavy, but there's another way of being heavy, all right? Now, does human belong in music? Yes, because it's another way of making the music heavy, all right, that's what I think. And I've tried to argue why I think that's important. Now, if you are sat there going, well, I don't like it though. I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know, as soon as there's jokes in music, it's, it just doesn't seem serious, right? What you're doing in effect is judging. You're not making a judgment that it's serious because you've weighed the concepts and really established how serious and heavy and important this is. You are just sniffing it for seriousness and go, oh yeah, this smells pretty serious. Yeah. You know, um, and as Frank Zappa says, jazz isn't dead, it just smells funny. But is jazz really that funny? Or is it just the smell that's funny? Okay, so um, I think I've, I've, I've got to the end of this video. Um, I'm quite happy with this video because I did try my best to be serious on this. I, I did want to do something that was a little bit more intellectual and be more serious and I did want to get into some other areas and look at the sort of history of comedy and how that relates to music and how aesthetic works. I think this is one of the things to get from this is that aesthetics um, is really to do with what we like and what we don't like. It's the negotiation of that and humour, you know, the, the, the way that it um, disguises our disgust urge for ourselves and for the person we discussed it, or the concept we discussed, it's not the people, it's the concept. Um, the way it does that is brilliant and it's a very difficult thing to achieve. Comedians are, for me, amongst the great artists, right? Now, there's something else I wanna, I'm gonna say something else, I'm not gonna, I was just about to finish up. Um, 
another thing about rock and roll, okay? Rock and roll is fundamentally a product of postmodernism. So modernism was a sort of a cultural movement that starts probably around about the First World War and ends, in, say, in the early 60s. It's, it, it contains the two world wars. It, it covers a period of in extreme industrialization. It's about how we culturally um, interface with a certain type of technology and cultural change, you know. One that brought about mechanised warfare, but also brought about flying, and, you know, it brought... It brought it, it, it's embodied, I think, by the jazz age. It's, it's the flapper dancing to jazz while standing on the top of an aeroplane. That, for me, is modernism, okay? And when you look at them, all those girls that are on top of the aeroplane, they're kicking in unison, they're all the same. You know, it's it's the image of of rows of tables uh, with typewriters on them, with everybody typing, and all the things are going in the same way. Okay, that's that um, is so beautifully um, portrayed in a film called The Rebel, and the, the film The Rebel is a film by Tony Hancock, who was one of the great um, British comedians. I think actually we got him. Have we got him here? The, there, that's Tony Hancock there. I've got this album, a comedy music that I put out. There he is. Um, and um, The Rebel was made in 1916. It's right at the end of the modernist period. And um, in that film, Tony Hancock goes out and he meets the existentialists. You know, he's a fake, basically. He's a fake artist. It's a brilliant film. And I think it really... Um, the first half... He's a cog in the machine. He is um, a, a member of the modernist world. He, he, he's like a he, he's a cog in the machine, and he has his role. But he wants to break out. He wants to be an individual. He wants to be ex to express himself. Right. He what all his idiosyncrasies is that make him who he is. He wants those to um, uh, to be expressed in some way. Now the fact is he. He doesn't express them well. He's not a great artist. but And the comedy is in the fact that we want him to be able to express those things, but when he expresses them, they're terrible. And he doesn't realise it. His pomposity is to think he's a great artist, and the film pricks at that. And it doesn't prick it for him. It pricks it for ourselves. We all have that pomposity in this. It's an absolute brilliant com comedy film. Um, the... So the postmodernist era that sort of emerges at the end of the 50s going to the 60s is a, a lot more about self-expression. It's a lot more about um, the lived experience of that person, that their truth is theirs. It's not an absolute truth of modernism, right? It's, it's come out of existentialism through postmodernist philosophers like, you know, Derrida, Foucault and all these people. And these ideas start to get a grip aesthetically that they start to emerge in the arts right and one of the great positive things about postmodernism in term aesthetically is it's like it's as though the world goes we need more we need to hear different voices right who, who well we're not we don't hear these people's voices we don't hear you know um afro-americans voices we don't hear that we keep those out we keep gay people's ideas out we keep um, women's ideas out we you know we, we, we're 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 holding all these people down. What have they got to say? The civil rights movement isn't just about giving all these people rights. And this is a product of postmodernism. It's a pro it's a product of um, saying, well, these are individual people. Hang on. These are, they're, they're not part of a group, you know, that we just put in our sort of modernist box. That they're there and they're there and they're there. These are individuals. That got, and what have they got to say? The important thing about this period in the 60s is that people go, oh, I wonder what they have actually got to say. You know, what are these blues artists from the 30s? Everyone ignored them at the time. It just seems like a colloquial thing. But if you actually listen to it, they're saying some mad stuff. You know, they're not virtuoso classical musicians. They haven't come through that sort of background. But it's a completely different thing, right? That there is, we owe so much as rockers to, um, especially you know, middle-class art, art educated, you know, um, white males, young white males, desire to go and check out Robert Johnson and um, 
Charlie Patton and Blind Lemon Jefferson and all those people, you know, that's, that's, that's that opening up of um, the viewpoint and putting the emphasis on the individual, it, it's, it's an incredible thing. Now, um, I've always seen the um, development of rock music as opposed to rock and roll that happened in the 60s as it's it, it's um, happening at the same time as the emergence of Monty Python. And Monty Python, to me, are, in terms of like British rock music, Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, all of those bands have something of the Monty Python. Now, the thing is, is, of course, who paid for Monty Python's films in the 70s? It was a bunch of rock stars that paid for it, you know. Um, when I was... Uh, playing with Robert Plant and going around that the Monty Python and spin off stuff like you know Spike Milligan ripping yarns this was continually sort of quoted by that generation because it had emerged all at the same time you know now Monty Python has a sketch where um, it's called the Ministry of Silly Walks now most people watch this just think it's silly it's just silly. It, it, there's no meaning to this. It's just funny because it's silly. That My God, there's a meaning, right? What that portrays is a certain class of person that is destined to go a sub certain way. So the, guy, the guys that were in Monty Python were highly educated. They'd gone to Oxford and Cambridge. They were destined for the civil service. And what they're saying is, is that this is what we're destined for. Something as pointless as somebody coming up with silly walks, right? And there's a, something that's really telling in that because when he first leaves his house, when John Cleve um, leaves his house, as he walks out, there's a queue. There's a queue of guys in black flat caps and in, you know brown overcoats who are queuing into another sort of council house down the road. Their destiny is somewhere else, all right? And I think what we have with rock and roll was a generation that went, I'm not, I'm not having it. I'm not doing it, you know. I'm not wearing the same clothes as my parents. I'm not going to have the same haircut as my parents. I'm not going to listen to the same music as my parents. I'm not going to do the same job as my parents. I'm not going to do it, right? That fundamentally, more than anything I've ever said on this channel, ever, is what this music is based upon, right? All the outlandishness of progressive rock, all the incredible dynamism and... Um, future thing that's in jazz fusion right all the stuff that makes this music um at once revered and loved but also by the same token reviled okay because the powers that be right those ones who want to seem sophisticated there's something about it they don't like they don't like it. never happened to monty python monty python is held up as being incredible but for me you know monty python is the prog of comedy you know, the goon show that went before it is the rock and roll of comedy, okay? Um, so that direct, co you know, um, correlation between those two, and they're actually intertwined, I tell you, they're intertwined, okay? Um, I'm not just saying there's a link that I can see, I'm saying that, that, that the, these comedians, um, rock and roll, was actually linked, they were all together, all right? Um, I think that, want to not go down the same path as the generation before. That was the great cultural shift. Now, for me, philosophically, there is a ton of things wrong with uh, postmodernism. There's there's uh, category errors, I think, in that, you know, postmodernists can, you know, they make the claim that there's no truth, that, that, that uh, truth is socially constructed. Um, but he also, with the uh, rise of sort of um, identity politics, it embodies certain identity groups essentially. So it says that, you know, um, there's a white supremacy, for example. That's an idea of, of embodying uh, um, white people with essentialist traits. Now, white people behave badly through history. Yeah, of course they have. As of all other <laughs> members of all other identity groups. Um, but that's not the issue I have. That's just an argument of what the truth is, right? But of course, truth, what is the truth? So once you have this category um, distinction, 
where you have you you were saying that you know there is no such thing as truth and truth is entirely socially constructed biology doesn't play a part in it um you know uh our uh history doesn't play a part of it it's totally cultural history is a part of culture biology is a part of culture and 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 our society is our culture constructs truth right now that idea which was a bold and interesting idea in 1962 has now become an ideology it's the for me is part of the big pomposity right the idea that um identity groups have essentialist qualities you know that um, and this really comes from marxism the idea that there's 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 one group the proletariat which are um they're they're in, they're they're right they're they're correct they are embodied with truth worth virtue that's the word not virtue and the bourgeoisie that are embodied they're evil you know this is this i'm not saying they're not let don't think i'm not saying but what i'm saying it's wrong to embody them essentially and now why do i think that's wrong because you know to embody identity groups with virtue traits and then judge the individual on those traits for me is textbook definition of prejudice right uh, it's it's absolutely anti everything that rock and roll first started out but the reason why we're here right is because um, the ideas that emerged in the 1960s have now become ideological it's not the fact that the idea ideas are bad they can be questioned can they when you can take the mickey out of them when you can poke fun of them when you can question them right then it's a discussion that we can all have okay because the idea that there's not you know utility in postmodernist ideas is, is absolutely silly i know that because i'm a i'm a rock and roller i'm a rock guy and this is i know how important that is to this history you know but i think we're in an age now where it that is the great conservative um pomposity that needs to be pinpricked okay and um i feel that in terms of our musical heroes because um music has lost its its power to do that um the media has 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 lost the voices to do that we're lacking characters like frank zappa who were dangerous at the time this is the thing they they poked fun now um the identitarians will come along and say yeah but he was a sexist he was this he was that and they won't like him and because they believe in essentialism they're not able to go musically that's incredible um artistically that's brilliant that song that where i i i am with what he's saying lyrically is great but the fact that i find him sexist blah 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 means i then write off everything about them everything about him i just don't like it because of that okay um this is precisely the arguments that were put against rock music it was it precisely the arguments that were put against you know black musicians that were singing about sex and they were singing about murder they were singing about infidelity you know they were singing about you know the women you know rejoicing in their partners beating them up you know god i've got into sort of contentious area on this video i really have sorry i have haven't i right um you i believe we need a bit of humor in music right now right that that those ideas that have become so ubiquitous so ideological so pompous it needs someone to take the mickey out of them right that's the powers that be and and it's on the right and the left okay it feels to me that there's nothing out there that is really poking any fun at the stuff that needs to be poked at. Now, whatever your political persuasions are, I'm sure you agree that there's something that needs that needs to have that <laughs> at, done at it. Do you agree? Now, really, are you going to turn around and say, well, I don't think we should have humour in music? Right. I don't think you can. I just don't think you can. What do you think, Liberace? This is, I put up on here behind me, Liberace, the love album. That album was made in all seriousness. It's not a comedy album. 
Um, but we look at it with our postmodernist gaze. And not only can we find that vaguely amusing, but we could actually appreciate it in a way that, um, let's have a look at it. Let's just bring this up and just really rejoice. This beautiful cover, right? The lovely graphics on the back. Liberace, the love album. The artistry and showmanship of Liberace is now legend, an unparalleled show business phenomenon. His travels have taken him to virtually every corner of the globe, bridging the language barrier with his music, transcending foreign cultures and customs with his warmth and enthusiasm. Indeed, Liberace has developed his very own universal language, the language of love. The Love Album is dedicated quite simply to the beauty of feeling and emotion and the hope that someday all mankind will live in harmony. Oh my God, thank you, Liberace. Um, through the magic of Liberace and the sensitive arrangements of Jimmy Haskell, the album spans the spectrum of human involvement, each selection uniquely praising the multifaceted loveliness of love. And you know what I have to say about that? 